Oh, okay. We'll get rolling again. I've got a, a few people to turn up after coffee, but they'll they'll walk in at an appropriate point. And I'm I'm recording this by the way, so I can put it on my YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, you can see what's there on the YouTube channel. So that's Lorenz model with a shock, and I'll just bring up the model itself and and show it in more detail. By the way, notice this blue box up here. That's a group symbol, and sometimes uh, Minsky inserts one where it shouldn't do it. So I'm going to choose right click there and ungroup, it'll disappear. And then if I click on the zero key here, that will take everything back to the top corner. Little, little tricks like that in the user interface. But now I've got the system, and I'm going to put the shock into, into zero mode. Now, what I'm doing, by the notice I'm, I'm not touching the mouse here. When I've got my, my, my mouse cursor is on the, above the shock where you see the slider, if I press the arrow key, I pop between the two values. So I start in zero. Nothing happens. Go back over here, give a temporary shock, and off we go into that dramatic, chaotic system. And if I choose right click here and expand, then I can get a larger scale graph of it as well. And the, this was a stunning discovery for Lorenz because he was trying to make the point that non-equilibrium models of the weather will be dramatically different, but he had no idea how dramatically different until he did the simulation. And what you get is what we, we eventually christened the, the butterfly effect. And I think you might be able to see why they call it the butterfly effect. You know the idea of the butterfly effect? I think a butterfly flaps its wings in Ecuador. And by the way, you've got some pretty big butterflies here. I went to uh, Mindo and had this butterfly with wings about this high land next to me on, the, on my table while I was having, having, having lunch, which was great. Um, but that flapping of wings in Ecuador can cause a cyclone in China, meaning that a tiny shock can give you a very, very different weather pattern. And of course, that's the discovery you can see there. I'll just stop that simulation at that point. And that's what meteorologists discovered, courtesy of, um, of Lorenz's contribution. And the intriguing thing with meteorologists was how rapidly they adopted what the essence of what Lorenz showed in that simulation. Now, he said you had to, you had to simulate it as nonlinear and disequilibrium. Both words are necessary. Linear disequilibrium is boring. Okay? Nothing interesting happens in a linear disequilibrium system. I think I've built the world's only interesting linear disequilibrium model, uh, which I'm not, not showing here. But uh, otherwise, they're all boring. They either break down or they go to equilibrium. That's all you've got. Now, the nonlinearity is quite simple because what we've got in, in Lorenz's model is, is x or z multiplied by x, and there's y times x there, and there's z times x at that stage. So the nonlinearities are not imposing a nonlinearity, a nonlinear behavioral assumption on what weather clouds do. It's just multiplying two variables together. And then a single shock moves you away from equilibrium permanently. And you never get back to equilibrium again because the equilibrium, this is the important point raised a while ago here by one of the questioners, equilibrium, all three, the system has three equilibria and all of them are unstable. That's the graph I've shown you a moment ago. And the equilibria are there in the centre, there in the middle of that hole, and there. And all three are unstable. Now they're unstable in an unstable way. They're called strange attractors because they actually have three dimensions. There are three variables inside there. So the, the shape that they're moving inside is a three-dimensional shape. And there, two of them are unstable on two dimensions and stable on one. And one of them is unstable on one dimension and stable on two. Okay? And then what you get is the system gets attracted to them but gets repelled away, etc., etc. And you never, ever get to equilibrium. So if you define equilibrium in this weather system, you are telling you where the weather is never going to be. Okay? It's that big a difference between equilibrium and disequilibrium. 
And what then happened, um, it was, meteorologists moved over completely, not completely, but they've used many of the previous techniques as well, and I've now realised that I'm talking to somebody who has a PhD in meteorology, uh, the earlier questioner about meteorology up there, say, so you want to know what meteorologists really do? Talk to him, okay? <laughs> I can give you an overview, that's about all. Uh, I have not practiced for a while, so I'm not that aware of what's going on right now. Well, I've never practiced, so you're ahead of me. Um, and we should have lots of conversations about that too. Um, but that's, that vision of non-equilibrium being an essential part, non-linearity being an essential part of meteorology became commonplace. It was adopted dramatically. There was no political fight over it. There were no people whose reputations were ruined by being one side or the other. They just adopted the sensible ideas that Lorenz showed them and built the enormous models that are now used to predict weather much more accurately now than we could do 50, 60 years ago. Uh, that's one thing which I, <coughs> I focus on in, in the book I'm writing, are the predictions about Sandy, over the cyclone Sandy. The major reason why there was so little damage and so few deaths in America at the time was the models that the, the, the meteorologists used. There were some differences, but the majority of models did predict Sandy would move towards New York, and they did predict it would land on the New Jersey, Jersey shore. And therefore, all the rescue efforts and all the evacuations were focused in just that area. Now, if the, the, the zone which they said it would pass over, I think was something like about 70 miles wide. But if you go back something like even 20 years, the best they could do was about 250 miles. Now, if you imagine you've got a 70 mile corridor where you can say the storm is going to pass through here, evacuate everybody in the 70 mile cone, that's easy to do comparatively to evacuate anybody in 250 mile cone. Okay. And then you know where you've got to have your resources ready to move. So Sandy was a far smaller disaster than it would have been without advanced meteorology. And I want you to think about that in context of the global financial crisis. Was that a smaller crisis because of the warnings economists gave about it? Or a bigger one because they said there was nothing to worry about? That's how big a shift our discipline has to make. So one thing we can learn from what the meteorologists discovered back in the 1960s, and by the way, they were rediscovering, in a sense, mathematics done by the, one of the world's great economists, uh, mathematicians, Henri Poincaré, back at the turn of the 19th century. They rediscovered chaos. They rediscovered continuous disequilibrium. And that it isn't just a case of shocks disturbing you from an equilibrium, and systems always tend towards equilibrium, there are some systems, and in fact there are many systems, which are always unstable, will always diverge from equilibrium. And I would argue the economy belongs in that set. Now let's look at the simplest dynamic model that I think you can build. And simplest, for, it, it is simple because if you just simply work out the structure of the economy and add one assumption, you end up with this model. This is by Richard Goodwin written back in 1967. So much the same time as Lorenz, a few years after Lorenz. He said, well, capital stock, the amount of output you can produce depends upon how many factories you have. And the simplest way to put that together is say there's some constant relationship between factories and the level of output. Output determines employment. Once you've decided how much to produce, you have to hire the workers to produce that output. So you might have some constant relationship between output and employment. This is the only assumption in the model. The level of employment influences how wages are set in some way. The classic Phillips curve assumption that every economics model has, even when people complain about the Phillips curve, they still use it, okay? It's there everywhere. In this very simple system, there's only workers and capitalists. I've got no banks in the system as yet. And by the way, Richard Goodwin did not want to introduce banks. He and I, he, he and I have argued about that uh, back when I was doing my PhD. He tried to advise me not to bring in money, and I said, I'm going to bring it in. Lovely man, I might add. Um, and and the, probably the leading thinker in non-equilibrium economics that I'm sure most of you haven't heard of. So I'll be talking a lot more about him in this course. And certainly if I come back to Flaxo, his work will be a major part of what I, what I cover. So in the simple two-class system, there's workers or capitalists, 
The wages go up, profits go down. Profits then determine investment. In this very, very simple model, Goodman simply assumed that capitalists invest all their profits. Uh, they just simply are investment machines. And the cost of investment is the rate of change of the capital stock. Now that then brings you back to the beginning because I have capital stock up here and I've got its rate of change down here. So just using simple constants, let's see what we build as a model. And here's building at Minsky again. So off we go. So let me, uh, well, I, I decided to record the movies rather than trying to do this stuff live because when you do things live, you always make mistakes. Okay? Bill Gates does it. I'm going to sit back and watch a movie run instead. So off we go. Bringing down the variable so you can see it. And I'm calling this Y, the symbol of all economists use for GDP. I'm not giving a value for it. That's important. I'll show you why as we go on. Then a constant A, which is going to be labour productivity. And if you divide output by labour productivity, you're going to get L, which is the number of workers you're hiring. So here comes L. So output divided by labour productivity equals labour. And I'm going to have a population level as well, which I'm going to call N. And I'm not going to concern myself with population growth here or change in labour productivity. So I'm using constants in both cases. Then I'm typing backslash lambda, and that will give me the Greek letter lambda, the employment rate. Now I'm going to have Milton Friedman's going to turn up here. I'm going to assume there's a non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which I'm calling lambda underscore E, I think, for equilibrium, for EQ. Let's actually even put in an assumption we're going to reach equilibrium here, and this is we design the model. And notice I've got a subscript there, and I've got the curly brackets around EQ. That subscripts the whole lot. Um, if anybody knows what's called tech. I'm using tech commands here to format the characters. Again, no other program in the field does this yet, which I find quite remarkable. So you can't type Greek letters in other programs and you can't do subscripts, but we're allowing that because I think it's just better formatting. So now I have lambda, S is the slope. So I'm going to subtract the actual employment rate from, but it's like this equilibrium level from the actual rate to see if there's a gap. And then I multiply it by some slope to say how much workers react to that difference between the equilibrium level and the actual level. And that's going to be my wage change function. And I'm going to call this, I think I'll call it lambda underscore fn for lambda function. I could have called it wage function, but you can you could, you could get the model and edit that yourself if you wanted to. But that's the wage change function. So it's a linear Phillips curve function, effectively. Notice it's deliberately linear. I haven't imposed a non-linear assumption here at all. Everything's going to be linear. Now I'm going to bring down, go to define W for the wage. And because it's an integrated variable, I have to give it an initial value. So I'm saying the wage is one unit per annum. Now, so that's saying that the, the rate of change of wages. So what I've got to say is the rate of change of wages multiplied by the current value of wages, integrated is the wage. That's the differential equation. So if you think about the percentage rate of change of wages, you might say percentage rate of change of wages is 3%. That's 1 over y, w dw dt equals 0 0.03. You multiply through by w, so dw dt equals 0 0.03 times w, then you integrate. That's effectively what I'm doing there. It's describing it verbally very quickly. But I now have the wage. And now if I multiply the wage by labour, Notice I've flipped the variables around to make a circuit here. And that gives me the wage level, which I'm going to call W. And if I subtract W from Y, which is the level of GDP, that's going to be, give me profits, which I show as the Greek letter capital Pi, slash PI. Then simply assume that all uh, profits are invested, as, as Goodwin did. So profits becomes investment. And then investment, of course, is the rate of change of capital stock. So I've got an type K here for capital stock. And give it a value, say, 330 units of capital initially. 
And then we have the classic idea of the accelerator relationship, normally shown as V or mu. I'm using V here with a value of three, saying, so, you know, if you, if you have 330 units of capital, you produce 110 units of output. Now wire that all together. Now I need a divide by block here, which I forgot to put in, so I go back to move mode, bring down a divide by block, back to wire mode, wire up those two, and now connect it back up to white. And then grab the blue dot, make a bit of space. So I've closed the loop, and all dynamic models are like that. You get back to your starting point. And bring down lambda, which is the employment rate. Flip it around because if everything comes, once you flip, everything is flipped in the same direction. Change my step size to make it smoother again. Slow down the simulation, I know how fast it runs. And simulate. Oh, and what have I done? I forgot to put a uh, value for n, population. So the program warns me by putting a circle around where the error comes in. So I go back up here and I'm now typing in a value for n. And I should have shown that on the screen, didn't I? And there you go. So the equilibrium in this case is, is neutral. You neither get attracted to it nor repelled from it. And if I bring down a graph here, if I graph lambda against the wage rate, which I'll do in the bottom little graph there, if I attach the, the omega and the lambda to the same coloured input on the x and y, then I get an x, y plot of the two. And when you simulate it, you get a closed loop. So that's, in essence, I think the simplest possible model you can build of the economy. And what does it give you? Non-equilibrium. And that's what I think should be the starting point. There are many other dynamic models in economics, but that's the one I'd like to start with. And that's what I always start with myself in building a dynamic model. Much, much more generalization needed, of course. Yeah? The graph on the left side, what is the Pardon? We have the graph which is in the left side. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring up the actual model and show you in, in Minsky. That's, I'll just drag it over here. That's a graph of the employment rate against um, the, wa the wages level. So I'll just actually illustrate that in a bit more detail. Let's just, let's just grab both these graphs and bring them down here. And then zoom a bit and then pan over so you can just see the graphs. Again, all this stuff will make uh, more sensitive to the keyboard later, but this, this is as far as we've got right now. So I've got two graphs there. Now, notice if I, I have nothing put on the bottom axis here, so if I run the system, what I see is just lambda as a function of time. So time is on the horizontal axis by default and I'm laughing lambda against time. But up here, what I'm graphing is lambda against omega. So if I, let's just say, I'd, hang on. Let's say I delete that wire. And I'm gonna delete this wire. And I'll swap them around. I'm gonna right click and choose flip to turn that around so it's pointing the right way. Now if I wire this up here, Notice they're out of phase. So the top one is the wage level and the bottom is the employment rate. If I put them both on the same chart, let's do that. So I right click here and copy that, and bring it down here, flip it around again, and then wire that to say the, the blue line. Notice they're moving out of phase like cosine and sine. Okay, they're intimately related to each other, but always differ by a phase, which is an important thing. Again, a lot of economists think that if they're going to do, like we, we econometricians do co-integration, and first and second and third and fourth differencing and so on to find stable points. You could a billion times difference this and they will always be different, which would have economists, I'm not, I'm not an econometrician, I'm a bit of a critic of econometrics and I, 
I learned far more dynamics than econometrics. But a lot of econometricians would say, oh, well, if you can't get them to syn synchronise, they're unrelated to each other. Sorry. They're absolutely intimately related to each other, but out of phase, which is a common phenomenon in dynamic systems. So again, I think there's a lot we can learn from dynamic systems in general. Now notice here, that's... Actually, I'll, I'll just try to illustrate that point about how to use these, char these graphs again. If I delete that line and say attach the omega to the red, and then attach this to the black, I should get an error message. Let's see. Stop it and start. Yeah. See, input not wired for pen 2. That's pen 2, the red line there. So I delete this line and then wire that up to the red instead and then simulate. Then the bottom graph is it lambda and w against time. The top graph is w at wage at time t against lambda at time t. Okay? So that's, that's the logic there. So phase diagrams are an important part of how you analyse a dynamic system and that's how you build a phase diagram. Two-dimensional only in Minsky. Yeah? So it's out of equilibrium, but it's out of equilibrium, but when it's highly predictable. Yes, yeah. And unlike the, uh, unlike the, 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 uh, the Lorentz case. Yeah, there's only one non-linearity in the system. Now, of course, if you look at reality, there's many more non-linearities you could bring inside. One which uh, I've just recently had the importance of it pointed out to me in my own modelling is that uh, what I've got going on here is a, a necessary rigid link between the level of output and the level of demand. Now, I don't actually have change of stocks in the model. Now, the way you bring that in is that if I go back to the model itself, over here, and let's just zoom, and pan, and pan over a bit, I have capital divided by a fixed number is output. Now, of course, if I then have output being generated and producing stocks, and then stocks having disequilibrium dynamics, so you might have more demand than supply, therefore you've got to produce more rapidly, so you drop the value of the, of the V coefficient, increase it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, of course, you're going to have more nonlinearities. Okay? So the essential thing is to say this is the starting point. Okay? Okay? And, of course, when you look at the models I'll show you later, just by bringing in banking, I get a dramatically unstable system coming out of that, much more complexity, but still absolutely just putting our foot in the water of, of non-linearity. Many, many further developments to go. And that's why I'm looking forward to working in Ecuador and actually building a large-scale non-linear dynamic model. We might have to use the American economy as our first one because they've got better data. But hey, we can always give the Americans a gift. I mean, they try to give you a military base. You can give them an economic model. Not a problem. Okay. So... What you look at equations, what Minsky can now do as well, as I showed you earlier, is generate the equations and show you what your actually your mathematics is there. So those are the initial conditions and parameters. Those are the algebraic relations defined, and these are all coming directly out of Minsky itself. And those are the two differential equations, quite simple equations. So you can see your actual logic, and the idea is to be able to build this up and, and get feedback from equations to the model and vice versa as time goes on. And all you have to see that is just use output latex and then you have to have a latex processor. At some point we'll build a latex processor into the program. So you can actually then have a, a, the flowchart on one side and the equations on the other, but that will take more programming. But let's look back at where I started talking about dynamics versus statics now and look at some of those concepts that justified the initial choice of statics, which unfortunately economic stuck with. So Marshall says statics is simpler than dynamics. Well, at a simple level, that's true. But if you want to maintain the belief that equilibrium applies as you add more and more complexity to your model, you start having all sorts of distortions. You have to, for example, assume that people can predict the future. That is what rational expectations actually means. You look at what it means, it says you have a model in your head that means you can forecast the future accurately. And I'll show you literally quotes to that effect, uh, talking about where rational expectations came from. That was needed to hang on to the belief in equilibrium through time. Now that, I think, is rather more complicated than saying, we don't know the future, things will change, that's what this model in time. 
So the initial supply and demand, sure, that's simpler with two intersecting lines. But in reality, to build a sophisticated model of the economy, we should have to, it's harder to do that with equilibrium than it is to do with non-equilibrium, certainly with modern tools as well today. Secondly, the conclusions you get aren't what Marshall thought would happen. Has anybody seen that theorem before? Sonnenschein, Mantle, de Broek. Ever seen it? Yep, way well, Wilson, of course. <laughs> but okay, I highly recommend you guys check that out. My book, Debunking Economics, will give you a good overview of it. Neoclassical economists hate the way I describe it. All the more reason to believe I've got it right. It proves that a multi-market economy, the demand curve in a multi-market economy, can have any shape at all. So the demand curve that I've been drawing beforehand, a nice downward sloping demand curve, you can't draw that for more than one person, one, one commodity market. As soon as you have two people and two commodities, that's more valid as a demand curve. The more general case looks like this. You find me a textbook that draws a demand curve like that, I'm almost going to say I'll give you a thousand dollars, but I probably wrote the textbook, so it doesn't work. Okay. Schraffer wrote a critique of Marshall productivity theory, which showed that's incoherent as well. And I've done a critique of the theory of competition, which argues the supply curve A doesn't exist, and B doesn't have the shape neoclassical think it have anyway. So there's all sorts of flaws. What Marshall thought was statics was not how statics turned out to be. So there's two major errors in that front. He said it might be useful training. Well, the trouble is, in fact, it's counterproductive. People who work in statics, because it's so complicated to put together these really, really detailed equilibrium models, they haven't got time to go and learn differential equations properly from a true mathematician and learn about nonlinearity and disequilibrium and so on. Okay? They have some exposure, and they're going to say they don't have any. But what you do in a static model is very, very different to what you do in a dynamic model. And presuming it's stable is in general false. I've given you one example of Lorenz, or actually two, Lorenz and Goodwin. I'll give you a few more examples at the end of this lecture. And saying it might be a first step towards a more general case, which is too difficult. Nothing is too difficult these days, given the technology we've developed in the 21st century. I've shown you a bit of what you can do with Minsky. All of you have flown, I presume, in a 747. Okay, that was designed with old-fashioned technology. Who's flown in a 777? Or an Airbus? They're designed using a software. Not Minsky, obviously. But they designed them first off in the sort of software I'm showing you now. So this stuff can design as something as complex as an intercontinental airliner. We don't call them that anymore, but that's what they are. So we have to go back to the original dynamic economists. To actually do it, we, we can't really build ourselves on what's come out of the neoclassical school because that has diverted from dynamics so much and built a whole structure on equilibrium thinking so much that you only get minor insights out of that whole school of economics that are worth using. If you want to find where the real dynamic modeling was done, you start with these guys, Marx, Schumpeter, Fisher, Keynes, and Goodwin. And of course, Minsky brings them all together later. So I'm going to go through each of them now, a bit of a summary, and I'm going to hit you the heavy duty tomorrow. Let's see what I've got as an overview. So Marx, his cyclical vision of the economy actually is what inspired Goodwin's model. Most people aren't aware of that. I'll show you that later. Schumpeter's vision was economy permanently in cycles. And it was driven by entrepreneurs searching for profit. Now, I know a major part of what Ecuador is trying to do is to build an entrepreneurial class in your own society. So I think a lot of wisdom is there in Schumpeter about what that might mean and how you might go about it. Fisher spoke about cycles becoming breakdowns because of excessive levels of debt. Keynes, I regard as a minor contributor to this area, by the way, even though I call myself post-Keynesian, I don't regard Keynes as being as important as some of the others. And a lot of what Keynes did actually pushed us back into static thinking. I'll be critical of Keynes when I talk about money later on in the course. But he certainly talked about uncertainty and expectations driving how we invest and those expectations being extremely fragile, all of which is extremely important 
and Goodwin was the person who brought the mathematics of nonlinearity and cyclical instabilities into economics. So a quick overview of each of them now, and then we'll come back tomorrow and I'm going to get you heavy duty with each of them. So Marx. Well, Marx is traditionally linked with the later theory of value. And my first academic work was on critiquing the labour theory of value. So with any Marxist in the room, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. Um, that that labour theory of value had a crisis vision of capitalism. It was going to collapse. Socialism was inevitable. Yada, yada, yada. And a major driving force with this tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Now, I have an alternative perspective that says, first of all, if you read Marx properly, he contradicts the labour theory of value. That was my, my original master's thesis. Given that, there is no tendency for the rate of profit to fall, and therefore no inevitability of socialism. And you get inherent cycles coming out of the economy. And to understand those cycles, Marx's philosophy of dialectics is actually extremely useful, but it's probably not what you think Marx's philosophy was. So his starting point was... Hey, who's, if, has anybody heard of what's called thesis, antithesis, synthesis? Okay. That's not Marx. It's actually another 19th century philosopher called Fick. Somehow that got confused and people think that's Marx's dialectics. I've read everything Marx ever wrote in economics. I've not once seen those words used. Okay. And I finally found one book that also had the same argument, a book called Marx and Contradiction by a guy called a while, W-I-L-D-E, and confirmed my position. But what you actually find is this is Marx's idea of dialectics. He says every unity, every object, is embedded in a society. You, are, Each of you is a unity. This is a unity. That's a unity. Any object. It doesn't exist in, in, in isolation. It's in a society. Society will focus upon one aspect of that unity. So that becomes the foreground aspect. Now, for yourselves, in a capitalist economy, the main thing society focuses upon is what do you do for a living? You're a worker. That's the foreground aspect. But you can't exist without the rest of you. Okay. So there's a background aspect as well. So capitalism worries less about what you do for relaxation and more about what you do for a living. So there's a tension between the foreground and the background. And that dialectical tension can cause change over time you might decide to drop out of capitalism and become a hippie. You might decide to become a top capitalist and buy the hippies. But change occurs. So unity, foreground, background and tension. They are the essential ideas that Marx has. And that's the basis of his cyclical model of capitalism that Goodwin later turned into a mathematical model. Schumpeter was rather different. Schumpeter actually accepted that Walra got it right. He was a great fan of Walra, and he believed that Walra described how equilibrium was achieved. He didn't know the mathematics to show that wasn't possible, so he, was, he believed you start from general equilibrium. But he said, in general equilibrium, profits above the rate of interest is zero. Nobody's making an excess profit. So that is a vision of capitalism, with capitalists who are making no money. Why be a capitalist if all you get is the same rate of interest you'd get if you put the money in a, banking, in a banking account? So he said real profits come from disturbing this equilibrium, what he called the circular flow. And he says, imagine somebody in textiles who works out you can go from hand looms to power looms. Borrows from a bank. Notice he's got banks in there straight away and create a business. And then if a worker can now produce six times as much in a day using the machinery, as they would have been able to use using a hand loom, then given three conditions, which I'll talk about next uh, tomorrow, you'll get a surplus, and therefore you'll make genuine profits. And that necessarily ties banking into the disturbance in the economy. So credit is essential. It creates the purchasing power that lets entrepreneurs bring new ideas in. So there's a positive and essential role for finance turning up in Schumpeter here. And given this combination between entrepreneurship disturbing the stability of production by innovation and finance, you get physical and financial cycles. And the economy will expand when people are paying for new innovation 
and potentially contract when that new technology turns up. Imagine what's the most, well, smartphones have been around for quite a while, uh, and phones just replace phones. But imagine MP3 players, iPods and things like that. What did they do to people to produce video uh, tape recorders, cassette players? Does anybody know what a cassette player is? Okay. Of course, that meant people producing cassette back, they had to shut their factories down. So you reduce demand when you bring in a new product. You increase it while you're building it. So you get cycles coming out of that. Fisher wrote after he made the mistake of believing that we have reached a permanently high plateau in terms of share prices. He developed what he called the debt deflation theory of Great Depressions. And as I've shown you, it's inherently starting from disequilibrium. And I have to say that looking at Fisher as the archetypal conventional economist of his day, and also, in effect, the Paul Krugman of his day, because he wrote um, for a newspaper, I think he made more progress than conventional economists have done today by focusing on disequilibrium, as I've shown you from that quote. And the key disequilibria he saw were too much debt and too low inflation. And he said those are the two dominant factors that cause a depression. So overinvestment and overspeculation are important, but down the bottom he says they are the ones that matter most. And this final line, I think I've got it there, I fancy that overconfidence seldom does much damage except when, as and if, it beguiles its victims into debt. And he was talking very personally there, that he'd borrowed um, something of the order of $90 million. His net worth was $100 million. In two, in looking in terms of the year 2000, what he was worth would have, in 1930 or 1929 would have been $100 million in, nine, in 2000. He lost it all in a matter of weeks. Now Keynes, Keynes actually writes a lot of stuff that's equilibrium oriented. And uh, things like aggregate supply, aggregate demand, ISLM, which Hicks developed, they're all equilibrium ideas. But he also had some, some elements in parts of the general theory that talk about instability and disequilibrium. So saying, for example, talking about how you reach evaluation on shares, he said, evaluation is established as the outcome of the mass psychology of a large number of ignorant individuals. Not exactly the efficient markets hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And it will change violently when, ch when trivial factors alter. Because there's no strong conviction to hold those prices together. And all this stuff might look unreasoning, but he said, in fact, it's what else can you do? You do have no way of predicting the future that's reliable. Therefore, you're going to have unreasoning changes and yet at the same time they're reasonable because what else can you rely upon? So fragility, volatility and expectations were an essential part of Keynes. And Goodwin was a pioneer. He had the first coherent statement of the importance of nonlinearity. It was not by him but by Caldor. And Caldor looked at ISLM models and he said, well, if you have a, you know, every, everything economists draw has got straight lines. That's just being lazy, frankly. You don't have to draw a straight line demand curve. In fact, the straight line demand curve contradicts the theory. It should be curved because the straight line will intersect the x-axis and give you negative demand at, at well, um, hang on, <coughs> going on that way. You'll get the negative demand at some point. You know, the price drops enough. Ridiculous, okay? It's going to go infinite demand. But back to the ISLM, Calder said, if you look at a straight line ISLM, then the economy will be sta stable if the slope of the S curve is greater than I, and therefore you return to equilibrium, and that appears to be more stable than the real world. Or if the I curve is steeper than the S curve, then you'd always be going towards hyperinflation or collapse, which is more unstable. So he said, the only, since those are both wrong, the only conclusion we have is they co can't both be linear. <coughs> So seeing nonlinearity as essential was Caldor's gift in that particular case. But Goodman was the leading exponent of actually doing it, of building nonlinear models. And Minsky brought it all together in the financial instability hypothesis. Not with Goodman, unfortunately, because he and Goodman didn't like each other. 
but I built my model of Minsky by taking Goodwin's foundation and adding debt and endogenous money into it. And in this lecture, I'll go through the background of all those leading dynamic thinkers in economics. And here's some revision if you'd like some. Not a good idea. I know you're all working full time. But I've, if you enjoyed seeing how I built the Lorenz model, here are some other famous nonlinear models that give you the same sort of dynamics you saw with the Lorenz model. The Rossler retractor, the Duthing model, Van der Poel equations, those three. And these are the equations for them. And if you build them in Minsky, those are the dynamics you'll get. So if anyone wants to have a bit of fun tonight, give that a try. Thank you, and I'll see you tomorrow.